Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 92, December 19th to December 25th, 1862. Before we get going, I just want to mention, uh, I hope everyone has a happy holiday here at the end of the week, and look forward to seeing you very shortly in next year. Last week, we discussed the Battle of Fredericksburg. We will get into the significance and aftermath actually next year when we close the book on Burnside's tenure as the commander of the Army of the Potomac. This week, we are going to deal exclusively with actions that are directly involved around the first strike at Vicksburg. Van Dorn is going to get some redemption. Sherman is going to get a little bit of a setback. But first, we are going to see the deadly effectiveness of the early sea mine technology. Just as a quick note, on the Patreon, we mentioned a couple times now the Gods and Generals review... Part 1 has been posted, and that is live on there as of this recording, and we're going to be doing Part 2 here for January's Patreon content, so broke that up. Actually, talked so much on there, it's uh, 51 minutes of Part 1, so figured that's probably another reason why we need to break that up into two parts, so if that sounds like something that interests you, the link to the Patreon is in the description. And, of course, your support uh, would go toward the upkeep of the show, and it is greatly appreciated. On December 12th, we will have the sinking of the USS Cairo on the Yazoo River. You, of course, remember the USS Cairo, which was part of the city-class ironclads that made the river fleet so formidable. In December, the Cairo was looking for sea mines, or torpedoes, set out as an obstruction in the muddy waters of the Yazoo River to deter the approach toward Vicksburg. You remember we talked about here in a previous episode how the Yazoo River was going to be important and still going to be important toward the eventual Vicksburg campaigns, and obviously it's still important now, we're talking about it here. Two members of the Confederate Secret Service would wait for the ironclad to approach before detonating a torpedo, maybe even two torpedoes, that would make a large hole in the vessel, sinking the ship very quickly in 36 feet of water. There were minor injuries, but no fatalities in the sinking of the ship. I have seen this listed as the first time a ship was sunk with an electronically detonated charge although I have also seen that is not the way in which the explosives were actually detonated. The USS Cairo was found in the 60s, still relatively intact, and is on display at Vicksburg, so you can go and see it. On December 20th, we have the raid on Holly Springs, which will see the unwinding of the well-laid plans by Ulysses S. Grant. Let's first go back to mention the particulars of the campaign. Remember that Sherman has hijacked McClernand's army at Memphis, and will be heading down the Mississippi. In order to draw on the attention of John Pemberton and the Confederate Army, Grant will move his forces down overland toward Oxford, Mississippi. This move, of course, would put pressure on Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, and therefore it would mask Sherman's movements. The armies could move independently or combine, but either way, it would be discomfort for the Confederates. Pemberton would order a raid in response, hopefully to slow up the Federal movement. Luckily, he had just the right guy for the job. Earl Van Dorn had lost his bravado that had carried through Pea Ridge and the Second Battle of Corinth. Late 1862 Van Dorn will be quite the different guy from early 1862, although he is still going to be a notorious womanizer, up until a jealous husband unloads a derringer into his face in 1863. If we look at both of those campaigns, though, Van Dorn was relying on fast movements for success. 
the kind of movements you would see on the frontier, which is a majority of his military experience. Given 2,500 cavalry, Van Dorn would be able to achieve lightning motion, and I will say probably play into that flamboyant attitude as well. Moving from Grenada, Van Dorn was able to move around the main army under Grant and target Holly Springs, Mississippi. This is where Grant had moved his supply to better service his advance force. Commanding the Union troops in this area was Robert Murphy. Murphy had been the same guy who abandoned supplies prior to the Battle of Iuka, allowing them to fall into Confederate hands. At Holly Springs, he has at least enough men to challenge Van Dorn's cavalry, but he has them spread out in a way that they will be unable to support one another. I have seen where there were warnings to protect the supply depot from a potential Confederate strike as well, advice that obviously went unheeded. Van Dorn's plan was simple. Capture the infantry camp, then the town, and the separate camp of cavalry. On December 20th, these would all go off without a hitch. Only the cavalry would make a slight stand, having been drawn up in formation that morning. Grant would label the men and officers, including Robert Murphy, as cowards and remove them from his command. A more concentrated and prepared force was able to hold off the cavalry using a blockhouse after Holly Springs, which is a better example of how infantry and fixed positions could have been used as opposed to an open camp. Van Dorn's raid would see the capture of some $1.5 million in federal property. This coincided with another raid that Nathan Bedford Forrest was conducting in Tennessee, which would further demoralize and derail the campaign. You can combine this with the failure at Chickasaw Bayou, which we will get into at the close of the episode, but essentially, in this sector, Grant would have two potential avenues in which to operate, and with Holly Springs and then Sherman setback, he goes from two to zero, essentially. So uh, keep that in mind here. We'll get into Chickasaw Bayou at the close. This raid, in some ways, was actually lucky for Grant because it overshadowed General Order Number 11. In an unfortunate episode in the career of General Grant, General Order No. 11 will expel Jewish people from his military district. Now, why exactly would Grant issue such an order? Well, it does have to do with cotton and the potential illegal trade of cotton. As the Union Army was able to add Confederate territory under their control, those who sought to capitalize financially would come with the armies. Obviously, with a blockade, the cotton planters were unable to operate as they usually did. These individuals would buy the cotton at reduced prices and transport it north. As you can imagine, you could probably make a fairly good profit doing such a thing because you could either be obviously using it to sell to individuals in the north or you could also be shifting it toward overseas, right? So either way, you're probably making a good amount of money because the cotton planters, they're not really going to have too many other buyers lined up. So in order to make sure that their product is moving, you're able to gouge them with these very reduced prices. We already had instances where union officers are being accused of showing favoritism toward individuals coming in or, or even having corrupt practices involving individuals coming in and being able to resell the cotton. So this is already a problem, and Grant obviously is, is aware that it is a problem. Eventually, the government would step in for an attempt to regulate such activity with only those with permits allowed to engage in the business. Still, there were those who operated illegally, and officers who received kickbacks in the army for looking the other way. In the more cotton-rich district Grant found himself in, this would be an issue. His father, Jesse Grant, would, in the meantime, secure a meeting at his headquarters with the Mack brothers, prominent businessmen from Cincinnati, who happened to also be Jewish. <laughs> 
In exchange for the meeting, which hopefully would have resulted in a permit, the elder Grant would receive a percentage of the profits. Grant, obviously, was upset and embarrassed, and in so doing, he would lash out at the Jewish people in General Order Number 11, which we have. The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department, and also Department Orders, are hereby expelled from the Department. Within 24 hours from the receipt of this order by post commanders, they will see that all of this class of people be furnished passes and required to leave, and any one returning after such notification will be arrested and held in confinement until an opportunity occurs of sending them out as prisoners, unless furnished with permit from headquarters. No permits will be given these people to visit headquarters for the purposes of making personal application for trade permits. Halleck would get Grant to rescind the order, but not after there had been some families relocated as a result. Now Halleck was no saint, he was not a fan of the common practices, and I have also seen blamed Jewish traders for the behavior, but Lincoln would put pressure on Halleck to make it happen. The question is, was Grant an anti-Semite? It surely does not look good based off of this order. Later, he would apologize for the order, which we can see may have been more directed at his father's actions than anything. Particularly number three of what we just read, which barred visits to headquarters for permits. If we take a look at that, we can actually link that and correlate that to his father's actions, and this makes sense. Regardless, it is going to be a stain on the record for Grant for the rest of his career, including his time spent in the White House. Still, he would redeem himself maybe, learning from his mistakes during his presidency with the appointment of Jews into positions in his administration. While Grant was pushing on Pemberton from the east, Sherman was making his way down the Mississippi toward Vicksburg. His forces would move past Milliken's Bend and make a landing at the Johnson Plantation north of Vicksburg. Sherman would have under his command divisions from Andrew Jackson Smith, Morgan Smith, George Washington Morgan, and Frederick Steele. And if you don't think that having a Morgan Smith and a George Washington Morgan, and also if you kind of throw Andrew Jackson as another president's name in there, if you don't think all of that was sort of confusing when you're reading about this, uh, you're, you're wrong. It was sort of confusing. <laughs> Andrew Jackson was also known as Whiskey Smith, and was a native of Pennsylvania, having served in the army, seeing much action against Mexico and on the frontier. He will go on to command in the Western Theater, being a capable officer. Under him are two brigades, one commanded by Stephen Burbage, who won force martial law in Kentucky in 1864 and will be controversial in his punitive measures. Morgan Smith will serve in the West, resigning before the end of the war and serving as the U.S. Consul in Hawaii. George Washington Morgan is an interesting character. He served in the Texas Revolution, attended West Point, but did not finish due to grades, and then served against Mexico. He will become a lawyer prior to the war and serve as an ambassador to Portugal. After the war, he will serve in Congress. Steele was a New York native, West Point graduate, and veteran of the Mexican-American War and the Yuma War. He will serve with distinction in the West. Morgan Smith would have some veteran soldiers from previous campaigns, including David Stewart's brigade, which had the 54th Ohio and 55th Illinois, who, if you recall, had been on the extreme flank of the Union line at the first day at Shiloh. Giles Smith commands the other brigade, and if you remember, was, he was also a veteran of Shiloh, along with two Missouri regiments. Frederick Steele had a brigade commanded by Francis P. Blair, who you will remember from the early conflict in Missouri. Blair has the 30th Missouri, the Shamrock Regiment of Irish Volunteers, as well as the 13th Illinois, nicknamed Fremont's Greyhounds, a veteran regiment. All in all, there was a good mix of veteran regiments in these brigades, 
who had seen action either at Shiloh, Pea Ridge, or Corinth to steady the more rookie regiments that had been filtered in. The Confederates had far less. In fact, facing the Federal landing on December 26 was a hastily cobbled force of Confederates under Stephen Dill Lee. Lee would rise to become one of the better generals in the Confederate Army, the youngest lieutenant general for the South in the war. He's actually already been in our story, and perhaps we'd mention him, maybe not, but he commands the artillery at Antietam in the northern sector, if you will, of the battle uh, around the Dunker Church. So he is there having a great effect on the battle and is the target of some of those Union assaults, as you recall. They're, they're marching toward these guns that are placed along that higher ground there. So he has been rewarded from that good service and it now sees an expanded command out here in the West. In December of 1862, he would have only some 2,700 men against Sherman's 30,000. But the Southerners were aided by several things. Number one would be the terrain. Dense forests, steep banks, swampy terrain made up what the Union infantry would have to cross to get at the rebels. Additionally, the position of Chickasaw Bluffs was higher ground complete with defensive works, a formidable position. The number two factor going for the Confederates was that Pemberton was on his way back to Vicksburg with reinforcements, Grant's movements having spluttered out. Lee would only have to delay the Northerners long enough for the rest of the army to arrive. On the 27th, there would be skirmishing with some advanced regiments, including action for the 54th Ohio and 55th Illinois, who would drive away the 31st Louisiana. Continued skirmishing would see Morgan's division engaged. Steele was attempting to move around the flank of the Confederates, but would meet poor terrain. Men under Colonel John de Courcy would run into the Confederates, sustaining fairly heavy casualties in the process. On December 27th, the Confederates would begin to be reinforced. Pemberton was in Vicksburg, and a division of troops under Martin Luther Smith arrived, Smith taking the reins on the battle. Smith was a northerner by birth, making him fit well with his superior Pemberton. An engineer, he had been placed in charge of the Vicksburg defenses. He has with him brigades under the command of Seth Barton, John Vaughn, and John Gregg. Barton was a Virginia native who had served in the Army in the West before the war. He will bounce around during the conflict, eventually sailing back at Fredericksburg, while he would become a prominent chemist. Vaughn was a Tennessee native who had served as a volunteer during the war with Mexico. After Vicksburg, he will be paroled and go on to fight in the Shenandoah Valley and with Early's move on Washington. John Gregg was an Alabama native who moved to Texas, participating in the Secession Convention and the Confederate Congress. Gregg would resign to join the Army and eventually will go on to command the Texas Brigade in the East until his death at Petersburg. It is interesting, there are accounts from this battle that are perhaps evidence of free blacks serving in the ranks and of the Louisiana troops, something to have been known to happen on occasion. Morgan Smith would be wounded on the 27th, quite severely actually, it being this wound that forced his resignation later on in the war. Stewart would briefly take command before the two divisions were placed under the care of Whiskey Smith. Sherman had ordered demonstrations in force against the Confederate works. This would include an attack by Morgan's division, supported by Blair's brigade, toward a location on the Confederate line that included an Indian mound. The colonel of the 13th Illinois would be killed in this action. Meanwhile, the rest of the attack by Morgan's division would come to nothing. The 28th and 26th Louisiana would do good work in delaying the Federal advance. Actually, the 28th Louisiana would by themselves hold off not only to Corsi's lead brigade, but Sheldon and Lindsay as well, for as much time as they would before withdrawing. 
allowing for more reinforcement and bolstering of the defense. We have an account from a member of the 42nd in de Courcy's brigade. The 42nd charges down into the dry bed of a bayou, leading directly toward the enemy's batteries. We rush forward 50 paces and halt to examine the batteries. We rush forward 50 paces and halt to examine the ground. We dare not go further, for that will be raked from front and to rear. The brigade lies down. A sharp fire continues along the whole line. Balls come, zip zip, into the trees and ground around us. Occasionally thud, a bullet takes some poor fellow and he is carried to the rear. Eventually, added pressure would force the 26th Louisiana to advance and cover the retreat of the 28th, that regiment having done their job much in the same way Barksdale's men had done at Fredericksburg. Now, the 26th occupied a location where, if one were looking at a map, Chickasaw Bayou runs from the Yazoo and splits before the bluffs, this location coming to be known as the Bloody Triangle. It is kind of interesting when you do look at a map and it's almost like the bayou makes it like a natural moat before the higher ground that the Confederates are going to occupy, this being the Chickasaw Bluffs or also part of the Walnut Hills. You hear them called that, especially in reference to the battles around Vicksburg. On December 29th, Sherman would order a grand assault. Morgan would lead in the center, supported by Steele. A.J. Smith would move on the right with his two combined divisions, but the Confederates were well prepared. Much like Robert E. Lee, Stephen Dill Lee would, like at Fredericksburg, do a good job in fixing and preparing the battlefield. Obstructions were cleared and batteries placed at possible assault areas. Sherman would have a miscommunication with Morgan at this point. He would instruct for pontoon bridges to be constructed, allowing for a better movement across the bayou to assault the Confederate works beyond. Only one pontoon was set up, giving the rebels time to hone in on the potential entry point. Now it should also be pointed out that the Confederate sharpshooters played a part in the disruption around the pontoons. So in many ways, once again, that's also pretty similar to Fredericksburg, what's happening in the east as well. So we had Mississippi regiments breaking up the potential pontoon strike, which then was preceding the bombardment of the city of Fredericksburg that we talked about last week. Sniping in general, though, would actually punctuate the lulls in the action in this fight, also fairly reminiscent of World War I trench warfare. Abatee was sat out in certain places, as if the terrain itself would not be enough to give the Federals trouble. We should point out, yet again, that Stephen Lee was already an experienced artillery officer, so he was going to be able to optimize the ground in order for maximum effectiveness. Morgan's division would begin in the center, but make little headway. De Courcy's brigades would advance directly into the Bloody Triangle, as it would be called, and sustain casualties. In fact, the 16th Ohio of this brigade would suffer the most casualties on the day in this assault. Confederate fire was so accurate and the terrain so formidable that many Federals would stay where they were and be picked up by Lee's Confederates advancing beyond the line. Thayer's brigade of Steele's division would move forward in support of these attacks. The 4th Iowa would move across the pontoon, but the rest of the regiments would not follow in support. Fighting for some time before withdrawing, Colonel James Williamson of the 4th would be the sole recipient of the Medal of Honor on the day. Thayer does write about this affair, and we have a quote from him. We crossed the bayou and went over the enemy's outside works, which had been intentionally abandoned. I then directed Colonel Williamson to deploy his regiment to the right and extend them as skirmishers. We were still advancing in front of the enemy's rifle pits and batteries and crossed over a high rail fence. I had supposed that five regiments were following me. I found myself within the entrenchments where I had seen 
as we went over, a regiment of our troops lying in the ditch, entirely protected from rebel fire. I ordered and begged them without effect to come forward and support my regiment, which was not warmly engaged. I did not know what regiment it was. Thayer's other regiments of his brigade actually don't follow him, which is part of the problem. He only has the 4th Iowa attacking the Confederate works. Williamson is going to receive the Medal of Honor because he advances and holds his ground without any kind of support until Thayer finally informs him that he's not going to get any and he should withdraw, So, which he does. But at least for a short period of time, he's able to hold his ground and, and do it in the face of superior enemy numbers. Preston Blair would attack with his brigade on Morgan's left in support of the assault. His men would also move through difficult terrain, which included a steep bank and felled trees cut for the purpose of impeding their forward movement. A spirited charge would come to naught, the attack faring about the same as Morgan's. On the Union left, Giles Smith and his brigade moved forward against the Confederate line around the Indian Mound. His brigade would be stopped, but the 6th Missouri would force their way to the foot of the embankment. Some of the rebels would fire directly upon them as they tried to claw protection into the earth. Sherman would actually write about them in his after-action report. The men of the 6th Missouri actually scooped out their hands' caves into the bank, would shelter them against the fire of the enemy, who, right over their heads, held their muskets outside the parapet vertically and fired down. This definitely shows how disparate the fighting was, and much in the same way as the 4th Iowa, there was no support for the 6th Missouri, which was forced to withdraw. With their repulse, this would end the Battle of Chickasaw Bluffs. Federal losses were 208 killed, 1,005 wounded, and 563 captured or missing, compared to 63 killed, 134 wounded, and 10 missing, a lopsided victory for the South. A truce would be called the next day to collect the Federal wounded. Some of those men already been picked up by the Confederates. Sherman was willing to continue the campaign, but the elements and the addition of more Confederate reinforcements made things tougher. David Porter advised against a landing further up the Yazoo as well. Sherman would come up with a plan to attack Arkansas Post, which his superior, McClernand, will take full advantage of, as we will see early in 1863. With Grant done in by Holly Springs, Sherman's forces would board their steamers and withdraw. Overall, Sherman had been done in by Stephen Lee and his ragtag force, in their delaying actions. It is possible that if Sherman was able to break Lee, he could have actually captured Vicksburg. It would have required aggressive movement on the part of Sherman, and there is a little bit of hesitation here in this battle, which is not something we normally think about. Uh, it's certainly not lack of aggression when it comes to William T. Sherman, but he does hinder him in this battle, and if he had been a little bit more aggressive, he probably could have blown through uh, the 2,700 defenders, and it would be a very different campaign from then on out, and certainly 1863 would be a lot different. And with that, we will bring this episode to a close. We spent all episode talking about the first attempt at Vicksburg for Grant. The USS Cairo was sunk, and Van Dorn will make things difficult for Grant's diversion. Sherman will land very close to Vicksburg, but Stephen Dill Lee will perform well in defeating him at Chickasaw Bayou. Next week, we are going to begin what will become sort of a split, two-part episode involving the Battle of Murfreesboro, which is also known as the Battle of Stones River. So we will start that episode next week, and then we will officially draw it to a close in January of 2023. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated.
Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.